Good morning, everyone. We're so glad that you are here this morning. Welcome to Christ Church and Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. We can say it now because uh, Thanksgiving's over. Is anybody who is uh, who is like Christmas starts after Halloween? Do we have any of those people? Ugh. Ugh. <laughs> Thanksgiving doesn't exist. <laughs> you and Owen, that was it. The only people that raised your hands. All right, well, as we get started this morning, we're going to start out singing Hark the Herald Angels Sing. And this is a song that is sort of about the, the moment that the angels were singing and declaring the first Christmas to the shepherds in the field, declaring that Jesus was born. So we join the shepherds, join the angels this morning singing Hark the Herald. Hark the herald angels sing Glory to the newborn King Peace on earth and mercy mild God and sinners reconciled Joyful all ye nations rise Join the triumph of the skies With angelic hosts proclaim Christ is born in Bethlehem. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. Hail the heaven-born Prince of Peace, hail the Son of Righteousness, light and life to all He brings, risen with He. Mild he lays his glory by, born that man no more may die, born to raise the sons of earth, born to give them second birth. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King of heaven, come down. King of heaven, come now. Let your glory reign, shining like the day. King of heaven, come. King of heaven, rise up. Who could stand against us? You are strong to say in your mighty name. King of heaven, come. Christ by highest heaven adored. Christ the everlasting Lord. Late in time, behold him come. Offspring of the virgin's womb. Mild he lays his glory by. Born that man no more may die. Born to raise the sons of earth. Born to give them second birth. Hark the herald angels sing. Glory to the newborn king. Sing out, King of heaven. King of heaven, come down. King of heaven, come now. Let your glory reign, shining like the day. King of heaven, come. King of heaven, rise up. Who can stand against us? You are strong to say in your mighty name. King of heaven, come. King of heaven. King of heaven, come. Whoa, King of heaven, come. King of heaven, come. Whoa, King of heaven, come. 
your glory rain shining like the day King of heaven come King of heaven rise up who could stand against us you are strong to say in your mighty name King of heaven Hey, good morning. It's good to see you. I think I know almost all of you. Some of you are family visiting from out of town, but I think I know most of you. My name is JD. If we haven't met, I'm glad that you're here today. We'll have a oh, good to see you this morning. Uh, I, man, that threw me off guard. I didn't expect you to be here this morning. So awesome to see you. Good to see family members here from out of town who we deeply love and who are part of this church family kind of by proxy. So, so glad to see you. Um, my name's JD. I get to be the pastor here. During uh, Advent, during Christmas season, we'll have a little bit of a different flow, but I just want to tell you that uh, I know that we'll begin to see, already see during Christmas season, people who are kind of bouncing into church for the first time in a minute. I just want to put your mind at ease like about a couple things. One, the service will last about 70 minutes. Uh, I'll try to keep it uh, moving all season long. And then on Christmas Eve, when we meet at 3.30 on December 24th, it will only last 60 minutes. That will be uh, the plan for that day. But we're glad that you're, we're glad you're here. A couple things going on today. If you want to sing during Christmas, a lot of the songs over the next month will be really familiar. If you want to sing, that's great. If you just want to observe, that's great too. We're just glad you're here. Whatever you're comfortable with, we are all set with. And so the flow will be a little different. You notice over here the Advent wreath each week will have an Advent reading and light the candle as we anticipate celebrating the birth of Jesus on December 25th. And then uh, let me just share a couple of other announcements with you. One, at the end of the service today, I'm going to circle around and ask you to fill out a connection card that's kind of right in front of you. Uh, if you are an ADD person like me who can multitask, you can start filling that out early, but at the end, I'll circle back and ask you to fill that out. Second thing I want to point your attention to, next Sunday, we'll have family meeting. That's sort of our year in review lunch. So as soon as we finish next Sunday, we'll go downstairs. We'll have lunch for everyone. Even if people are visiting, that's great. We'll have plenty of food. We'll eat. The whole thing will last 90 minutes. The flow will basically be that we're going to tell you what happened in 2022, celebrate some incredible things that God has done in the last year, and then we're going to look forward to what God is calling us to be and do in 2023, and then uh, we're going to share the budget, um, just so that we operate as a family, and we always want to operate with as much transparency as possible when it comes to finances, so we'll share the budget for 2023, review 2022 financially, and man, God has been so good to us. Our church is about six years old. Uh, this church that we meet in, this building was built in 1849, but our church is about six years old, and God has been nothing but faithful to us for the last six years, and, uh, and you are the fruit of that. So I am glad that you are here. Um, the, the worship team is going to lead us in some more music, so, oh, there it is, Christmas Eve service, I almost forgot. I had two, I had two announcements. And I dropped the ball on one of them and put it out of order. So if you are an iCal note-setting person, if you, we're going to have a Christmas Eve service for the first time ever this year on December 24th at 3.30 in the afternoon. If you would like to go ahead and put that in your cow, that would be amazing. I think that's it. I'm going to turn it back over to you guys. I'm glad you're here this morning. All right, so right after JD just said that we sing really familiar songs, I'm going to teach you a new one. <laughs> um, but it's rare that, uh, a Chris, that new Christmas songs are good. <laughs> it's very rare, um, in my opinion. But <clears throat> it's also really hard to write Christmas songs. I don't know if any of you have ever tried to write a song, much less a Christmas song. It's hard. They either sound exactly like every other Christmas song, or they just sound kind of dumb, because you're trying too hard. But every once in a while, a song comes along like this that has one line, you know, nothing super special about it, but it has one line that really stood out to me. Now, worship leaders in my experience, many worship leaders agree that they kind of don't like Christmas season because they have to, they have this set, set list of songs that they kind of have to sing. They feel a little obligated to sing. And I used to feel that way. But then I realized, one, you could sing Christmas songs year round if you wanted to. So we sang Joy to the World in July this year. Um, but two, I also realized that um, it, it's, a, it's a special time of year. Like, it's important to recognize that this time of year is different, right? And I'll talk more about that in a second. But this song, this line in this song says that it's been 2,000 years we're still singing your song. So there's a little perspective, right? For me, for me too, right? For me first, but for you too. 
the, the fact that we're still singing those, quote unquote, tired old songs is amazing. 2,000 years. So I hope you'll stand up and learn this song with me. Or not with me, I've learned it. Learn this song with the person next to you. And uh, here we go. It calls, it's called Your Praise Goes On. A star in the sky, the Savior is born. Jesus Messiah has come. What happened that night will ring on forever Till every song has been sung And your praise goes on never ending Your praise goes on How sweet is that sound It's been two thousand years We're still singing your song Shepherd stood watch, and three wise men worshipped the babe who assembled the earth. Oh, what happened that night away in a manger? It changed the whole universe, and your praise goes on. Every tongue come and sing now. Glory to God in the highest. All oh, glory to God in the highest. Your praise goes on, never ending. Your praise goes on. How sweet is that sound? It's been two thousand years. Singing your song, hallelujah, your praise goes on, and your praise goes on. Amen, amen. Isn't that a great truth? Isn't that awesome? Hey, clap if you believe it. You're not just clapping for us, right? Clapping for the truth of what we're singing. And so when we sing something that is, man, uh, not earth shattering, but like worldview shifting, right? Um, it's hard not to respond. And, and so clapping is not always, it's not just telling us you like us. Maybe you don't like us. That's great. But you can clap for the truth that we're singing, right? Um, so uh, at this point in, this, in the service, we generally have a time of, of reflection and confession. And it I usually lead us to confession about um, things that we've been through this week, places that we've failed, places that we've sinned throughout the week, but I want to call you to something a little bit bigger than that today. Um, it's very easy to come into the Christmas season and be like, well, I got to do this. I got to get the presents. I got to get the, the turkey, the second turkey or the ham, right, <laughs> or whatever it is, right? I got to get this. I got to get that. And then we all want to go look at the lights somewhere and talk about how magical the season is, but really we're just stressed out. Right? Um, and it's easy to forget that the reason the season is magical, the reason the season is, is, uh, is uh, a mystery, right, is because Christ came down. God was born in human flesh. Jesus came, born in a manger, to save all of us who would accept him, to ultimately to die on the cross. And so what I want us to call, want to call us to, this, this song uh, is a little bit different than the traditional version. We're going to sing Silent Night, but it's a little bit different than the traditional version. It says, uh, has a chorus. It says, be still my heart, 
be still my mind. May I still see the magic of that silent night. Fill me with wonder, keep mystery alive. May peace on earth be my song tonight. And so what I want to call us to is a moment to prepare for the rest of the Christmas season, right? Confess our tendency to rush, confess our tendency to forget why we're actually here and to forget what Christmas is about. So I'm going to give you a minute just to do that and then we'll sing. kids you guys can be dismissed to your class now i believe we're doing it today yes all right kiddos
Everybody else, you can grab a seat if you want to. That would be awesome. Sorry. Kids, get out. <laughs> Let me read this to you quickly, if I might. Today marks the first Sunday of Advent. Each Sunday, as we move closer to Christmas, we'll light one candle. Most celebrations of Advent in church history had a twin focus. The Latin word that gives us our word Advent was a translation of a Greek word for coming, a word used for both the coming of Christ and human flesh and his second coming. Advent then always tended to focus on both Christ's first coming 2,000 years ago and his second coming, which he promised in the Gospels. For the first two weeks of Advent, the church would reflect on his second coming. Disciples would prepare their hearts, confess sins, and spend time hoping for the quick coming of the Lord. The last two weeks of Advent would then transition to focus on the first coming, the Christ child in the manger. While on and during Christmas we celebrate the birth of Jesus, the incarnation, Advent reminds us of our place between Jesus' birth and death and resurrection and Jesus' second coming. Advent and Christmas are not merely about the coming of Jesus, but about everything that has been since the birth of Jesus and is still yet to come. 700 years before Jesus was born, the prophet Isaiah wrote, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them the light has shone. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Just as Isaiah spoke in the present tense about the birth of Christ that would not occur for seven more centuries, today we light the first Advent candle in faith that though we wait, we celebrate knowing Christmas is coming in a manner of days, and we also prepare our hearts believing and trusting Christ is certainly coming again. Natalie, will you come and pray? All right, let's pray together. God, we are just reminded today of what the season is supposed to be about, Lord, and it's hard in our culture when you get taken out of everything. And so, Lord, um, help our hearts to be grateful every day, not just this season, Lord, not just because it's Thanksgiving and we give thanks or Christmas, Lord, but any good thing in our lives, Lord, your word says that it comes from you. If there's anything good, it comes from you. And I just pray that we would recognize that today. We would just speak to, speak to our hearts during this service. And, Lord, that you would um, have your way in our hearts. We know you'll speak to us, Lord, but just help us to listen and to respond. We get to choose, and I just pray that we would uh, make the best decision that we can make, and that is turning to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, guys. If you've got a Bible... Turn to the book of Isaiah this morning. I've got the page number for you. We're going to look at Isaiah chapter 9. Uh, and so it's page 536 and page 537 in your uh, paper Bibles below you if you want to use one of those. Over the next few weeks, we're going to be talking through a series of messages called the, the Gifts of Christmas, right? And uh, this kind of started for me, the idea of this sermon series started for me when, I don't know why, but one day I was looking up what have been the most popular gifts every year uh and so I, I i remember one year my mom finding me a castle gray skulls the he-man castle this was like probably in the early 80s and uh I, I mean i think she literally went all over the universe to find this thing she i know she drove like in two hours one one night to try to get it got there and they didn't have it she'd been told they would have it and, uh, and so I, I wanted to figure out what year that was that my mom went all over the world looking for that gift. And that, and that never was the most popular gift, but I looked at this, I found this website that talked about the most popular Christmas gift every year from 1920 until, uh, until last year. It's pretty incredible if you ever want to, if, you, if your mind loves stuff like that, look that up sometime for fun. And, and here are the things I found, by the way. So in, uh, in 1921, the most popular gift uh, in America was these, was Lincoln Logs. It's amazing these things have been around for 101 years. How many of you grew up with a, uh, playing with a set of these? Yeah, we still, we still have some of these. I stole these from the church nursery, but uh, for a long time we still, we, we played with those with our boys, and they, you know, there's question about are they named after Abraham Lincoln or were they named after the creator's father's 
uh, original middle name. So the guy who created Lincoln Logs was actually Frank Lloyd Wright's son. His name was John Lloyd Wright. Frank Lloyd Wright's actual middle name was Lincoln. So the great arch- one of the great architects in American history may have had these things named after him. In 1922, 100 years ago uh, this year, Tinker Toys were the most popular uh, gift. How many of you ever played with Tinker Toys? I, I tried to explain this to Natalie the other day. She was like, I literally have no idea what you're talking about right now. And so, uh, but Tinker Toys was 1922. 1925, uh, a guy, people had had stuffed animals forever. That was a thing for a long, long time. But a guy to honor uh, President Roosevelt decided to come up with a bear that he named the Teddy Bear. And in 1925, the Teddy Bear was the most popular gift for all the kids and all of America. America. In 1926, it was crayons. Uh, I don't know how you guys say, cra- do you call it crayons, crayons, or crowns, as some of uh, some people in my household call them. But uh, somebody had the genius idea in 1926 to come up with 22 colors that year. And so in 1926, the roaring 20s, this was the most popular thing. In 1927, it was the radio flyer wagon. How many of you ever had a radio flyer? Absolutely. So many of us had those. I remember one year, my dad got my kid, I uh, got Noah, I think, a, a a radio flyer tricycle and man that thing was gold it lasted forever and that was one of our favorite Christmas presents we ever got for him and in 1928 it was this now these had been around as the yo-yo and these have been around since like 500 BC they literally have been around forever but a toy manufacturer named DF Duncan senior was mass producing them he figured out a way to make 300,000 of them a day and uh, and so uh, and then William Randolph Hearst found a way to market it and it became like the toy of 1928 in fact, uh, Natalie bought this from the other day in preparation for this message. And it's actually a Duncan yo-yo. So literally, this exact same company is still making this thing 100 years later, which I feel like is pretty incredible. If you talk about something aging well, like some of the other toys from that decade did not age quite as well. But these ones, like these six, age incredibly well. Like it's hard to believe for me. So I remember playing with some of these things at my grandparents' house in the early 80s. Like how many of you were playing with these toys in the 80s, the 90s, 2000s, late 70s, that era? Think about that. When I was playing with these things in the 1980s, they were already almost three generations old. That's a toy that's aging really, really well. I think about radio flyers and Lincoln logs that I played with at my grandparents' house. That's a vintage toy. If, uh, the word vintage is defined as uh, there are three kind of marks if something is vintage or not. And, uh, and I grew up in one of those houses where anything was vintage if it was old. Like, and we saved most of it. Like, how many of you grew up in homes where it's like, can we throw that crap away? And you, and you had a parent who would like wash your mouth out with soap for even talking such blasphemy of throwing away something that was vintage. It wasn't quality. It just happened to be old. But to be vintage, something needs to be a couple things. One, it needs to be of high quality. And something like to be vintage, something needs to be of high quality. Two, it needs to be from the past. And three, and this is, uh, this is the, the thing that I think that separates something that's actually vintage from something that's just old, is it needs to be someone's best. Like to be vintage, something needs to be not just from the past, and it, not, it doesn't need to just be quality, it needs to be someone's best who produced it. And so today as we kick off Advent and the Christmas season, the title of the message is Prophetic Words, Vintage Truths. Vintage Truths, and I want to share with you these verses from Isaiah 9. Again, let me just uh, point out the fact, as we read during the Advent devotion, that Isaiah wrote these words 700 years before Jesus was born. Pretty incredible. 700 years before Jesus was born, these things were written. In fact, Isaiah, which is one of the longer books in the Bible, is sometimes called the fifth gospel, even though it was written seven centuries before Jesus was born. But because it so prophetically and clearly points to Jesus, uh, not calling him by name, but as we'll see today, uh, descriptors that could only be him. Uh, that Isaiah is called the fifth gospel. Now, someone could object and say, yeah, but you know, the thing about the Bible was just manipulated over the years after Jesus was born. It could be that Christians took Isaiah and took the Psalms and took the Proverbs and took the Old Testament and manipulated it. And somebody could have actually argued that up until the late 1940s, when in the late 1940s, in what is today sort of modern-day Palestine, north of the Dead Sea, uh, discovered in a cave was the Dead Sea Scrolls in the Qumran Caves, 
which were, those, those scrolls were put there literally centuries before Jesus. And so somebody could say, well, Christians just manipulated Isaiah, and they could have said that until the 1940s, but in the Dead Sea Scrolls, an actual fully intact Isaiah scroll was found. And so what we're reading today is exactly what was being read, prophesying about the Messiah 300 years before Jesus was even born. So with that said, let me read to you Isaiah 9. We're going to read verses 2 through 4, and then verses 6 and 7. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light, and those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness on them a light has shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you, as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil for the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor you have broken as on the day of Midian. Now skip down to verse 6, if you will. For a child, to us a child is born, to us a son is given. And the government shall be on his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government of peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Now, here's what's crazy about this. All those verses are written in the present tense. Isaiah is saying, look, this stuff is, it is happening. It has happened. But I promise you, it had not happened for Isaiah. Another objection could be that, well, Isaiah's writing about something that actually is happening in his day, and we'll, we'll just sort of um, overlay Jesus on top of it seven centuries later. The truth is, this was not Isaiah's reality. Isaiah is speaking about something that God is showing him that would happen in the future, the unknown future, but Isaiah believes it so certainly that he's speaking of it in the present tense. And so Isaiah, in verse 2, is writing to a scattered and disobedient and oppressed and conquered and splintered, broken people living in darkness. I'll give you that list again. And you can kind of see most of this in the text, and if you don't see it right here in the text, you could go and do just... A little bit of background into the book of Isaiah. If you've got a study Bible, you could go and read the background of Isaiah and, and see all of these adjectives that I'm about to give you describing the people he's writing to. They were, he's writing to a scattered, disobedient, oppressed, conquered, splintered, broken people living in darkness. The darkness of tough times, the, do, the darkness of family loss, their nation that once was so powerful has literally been, have become the whipping post of every nation. The problem for ancient Israel was they sat, at a piece of, they sat on a piece of land where if you wanted to get to Africa from Europe, you had to go through ancient Israel. If you wanted to get to Asia, I'm doing this backwards, if you wanted to get to Asia from Africa, you had to go through ancient Israel. If you wanted to get anywhere from anywhere in the ancient world, from kingdom to kingdom, to move things around economically, you had to go through ancient Israel. And this once very proud, very economic, economically strong nation has become the whipping post for decades and decades and decades. And one by one, the tribes are being picked off and vanishing and being, because of their sin and disobedience, they're actually going to become scattered by God. They're oppressed by stronger nations. They're becoming conquered. They're splintering. There is infighting within among the sort of 12 tribal clans of ancient Israel before anyone came and conquered from outside. There's family loss. There's poverty. There's disappointment. There's awful political leaders. A terrible economy and there's trauma and there's tons of sadness i don't want to be too heavy-handed here but i think a lot of us have had seasons in our lives where we have felt like we're living right in the middle of what isaiah is writing about we can feel that we can feel the weight of those things and so watch what happens it says the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light now remember this is future tense. It's not happened yet. Isaiah doesn't know when it's happened, but it's so certain that he knows that the people who are currently walking in darkness right now, 
Those who believe that Messiah is coming, they have seen a great light. And it says, on them has shown, present tense. It hasn't happened, but he speaks of it as if it has. And he says, it has shined into the darkness. Now that word there, that, um, that word for darkness, you know in Psalm 23 where it says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that word for shadow of death, that darkness of walking through like a, the valley between two canyon walls, that's what Isaiah is talking about here. He says the people who are walking in darkness, like the valley of the shadow of death, on them a light has shown, there's light I want to encourage you today that the world is dark. The dumbest thing that people believe is that people are inherently good. If you believe that today, I love you. Stop believing that. People are inherently broken and rebellious against Jesus. And we do some good things sometimes, but that's God's common grace just oozing out of us and helping us not to just burn the whole thing down. The world is dark. The world is broken. So when bad things happen to good people, guess what? It's the product of living in a broken, dark world. When we watch the news and we go, well, that sucked, and I'll never get that 30 minutes of my life back, it's because we live in a dark world. When we look and we see costs going up and sadness going up and people just feeling like, man, I've got to medicate my life or I've got to take stuff because the world is too heavy and too broken, listen, it's because the world is dark. It's broken. Like, don't live under any other delusion. And that's what Isaiah is saying here. The world is dark, and we need light that we cannot produce individually as a people. At best, the goodness of people, I love the Christmas season because you just see people do stuff that they never do the rest of the year. <laughs> I don't know if you do this on, on Christmas Day. Sometimes, you know, ESPN on Sports Center, they won't run the normal news or the last 30 minutes of an hour long show around Christmas and New Year's. They'll show these stories that just make you want to cry. Have you ever watched one of these? And Natalie's like, why are you watching that? And I'm like, oh, this one's going to be good. It's not going to get me. And man, five seconds later, I'm just like ugly crying, tears running down my face. Because usually uh, sports news is just sports or some athlete or millionaire or billionaire doing something dark and broken and sinful. Like the only, t like the only thing that the sports reports is either just the scores and what happened or something bad that happened, usually to very privileged people with extraordinary gifts. And so one day a year, if you watch it, like you will cry because you will see athletes and people doing stuff that doesn't, and, and we long for that. We long for the news stories where we don't turn on the television and see the fire that happened in the neighborhood across the city or the person who got credit card scanned at the holidays. We long for the good stories. We want the good stories. We want that. We want a light that we cannot produce on our own. And I'll tell you the truth. We also cannot produce it as a people. The stories are amazing. They're amazing. They're, a, they're enough light to light a candle. But what we need is a light that will shine into the dark caves of our hearts. And one act of somebody's goodness cannot do it. They're amazing stories, but we need a light that will shine into the valley of the shadow of death. And so Isaiah says in verse 2, a light has come, a light has shown. And watch what happens because of the light. Verse 3, he says, we have, seen a, we have seen a great light. And the results are there's growth. You have multiplied the nation. There's joy. They're rejoicing before you. There is blessing that is better than harvest, and there's blessing that is better than the spoils of war and the joy that comes from winning a war. Isaiah says this, this Messiah, this light, this king who's coming, I don't know when he's coming, but when he comes, it's going to bring th the feeling of victory like we just won a war and the, and the feeling after you just got a paycheck that was like three paychecks. You just, it, it did it, and there's going to be joy, and there's going to be celebration, and there's going to be blessing, and there's, the nation is going to grow, and it's going to be amazing when this light comes in verse 4. And the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, this, this king, this coming king has broken. This is all going to happen. They're going to be freed from oppressors, and how is it going to happen? It's going to through a baby. Isaiah's writing this, and he's seeing this. There is no such baby. 
there is not yet any such child. He believes it with such certainty, but he writes of it in the present tense. He says in verse 6, For to us a child is born, and to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. In other words, he's going to hold it all together. <laughs> How many of you have felt this year like you had a moment where it was all going to come apart? How many of you came here today because you're in a season where you feel like it's all going to come apart? This baby, this son who is given is going to hold it all together. The government will be upon his shoulder. The governing of the world, if it feels like the world is going to come apart, the governing of our lives, if it feels like our lives are going to come apart, the government will be upon his shoulder and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. I'm going to come back to this in just a moment. Verse 7, of the increase of his government and his peace, there will be no end. He, on the throne of David and over his kingdom, in other words, he's going to come from the eternal rule and the line of the Davidic king, like the good old days. I don't know what the good old days are for you. For me, I often pray, Lord, let the good old days still be lying ahead. I would rather not the good old days in my life and ministry be behind me. I don't want the good old days for this church to be behind us. I still pray that they would still be out in front of us and we would get to experience that. I pray that the good old days spiritually for Charlestown still lie in front of us. I do. I pray that a lot. And so um, Isaiah is saying, this baby is going to bring the good old days back again. It's going to be like the best it ever was. And then he says he's going to establish and uphold with justice and righteousness from this time forward. He's going to, ups- he's going to bring in shalom. He's going to bring in eternal peace. It's going to be not just like a return to when David, the best king ever, was king. It's actually going to be like a return to the Garden of Eden when there was no sin and no brokenness. And everything God made was good. And we hadn't just yet messed it all up so the truth about oh and and then here's the best part and i was reading this last night preparing and uh, i hadn't underlined this and i underlined this last night just to encourage you and us this morning the zeal of the lord of hosts the zeal of the lord of armies will do this be encouraged if you go man i cannot produce enough light in my heart to to light a small candle i've tried I cannot produce enough light in my family to fix anything. We're just roaming in the darkness as a family, just trying not to stumble over and swear in the dark. Listen, the zeal of the Lord of armies is going to do this. Redemption rests on the shoulders of the wonderful counselor, everlasting father, prince of peace, mighty God. It's not, the burden is not for us to go and try harder this Christmas season. The burden for us is to trust in Jesus. The truth about this coming child, son, king, Messiah wasn't true, though, because Isaiah believed it. Isaiah believed it and prophesied it because it was true. God spoke it. All this stuff didn't happen because Isaiah prophesied it. Isaiah prophesied it and spoke about it seven centuries earlier in the present tense because it was true. And that leads to the big idea, and I, we've already got it up this morning because I want you to see it. The truth about Jesus isn't true because you believe it. You believe it because it's true. We believe this stuff because it's true. Somebody may go, well, Howard, you've got to prove to me that this is true. No, I don't. It's true. I be- the proof is that I believe it. The proof of the gospel is that we believe it, and it is shaping us, and it is changing us, and making us a different people. That's the truth. That's the gospel. The best witness is our changed lives. We believe it because it's true. And this year, I'll tell you the truth, just sort of in a parenthesis, I believe these verses like never before, and I have experienced God in this way. And I want to walk through really quickly these four names that Isaiah prophesies about Jesus, what, what's true about him. The first thing that's true about Jesus is that he will be a wonderful counselor. This doesn't mean that Jesus is going to be a good therapist, by the way. Like, uh, he's not going to call you into his heavenly office and let you lay on the couch and be like, Jesus, let me tell you about the trauma of when I was four. It doesn't mean that at all. When it says Jesus is a wonderful counselor, it means he's a wonderful guide. It's a wonderful guide. Like, there's a great story that J.D. Greer tells. I'm actually going to quote this book three times today, so I'll go ahead and spoiler alert. It's in a little tiny book, Searching for Christmas. We'll have a few copies of this we'll give away next week. We have a freebie back there today for everybody who wants it. We only have 10 copies though, so if you don't want it, don't go take it. 
Um, but J.D. Greer tells this story about going to a foreign country with a friend, and they've got, and it's in Eastern Europe, and in a part of Eastern Europe that has traditionally been very hostile towards America and Americans, and he's scared to death because they go to this checkpoint, and everybody's got these big guns and serious faces. But J.D. Greer is actually with a friend of his who lives in Eastern Europe, and his friend says, look, he sees the, the nervousness in J.D. Greer's face, and, and he says, look, here's what I need you to do. I need you to look really serious for the next five moments. For the next five minutes, just look really serious. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to look, I'm going to say, now I need you to smile. And then they're going to tell you to do this. And at some points, I'm going to tell you, I need you to move really slowly. And then at other points, I'm going to tell you, do this really assertively. And J.D. Greer says, man, I was scared out of my mind, but knowing that my friend who had gone through this checkpoint literally dozens of times, and he was telling me what to do, and he wasn't afraid, was the most calming thing ever. And when the Bible tells us that Jesus will be our wonderful counselor, that's what it's saying, that he will walk with us through this. So he says that's the kind of counselor Jesus offers to be for each of us. He's saying the path of pain, I've endured it. Loneliness, I know it. Temptation, I know that. Betrayal, loss, heartache, I walk those roads. And I can reliably show you the way through them. I can guide you across that border don't worry, I got it. When Jesus says he'll be our wonderful counselor, that's what it means. He will get us through. And so Jesus, for the people without all the answers, will be our wonderful counselor. If you look at your life and go, I, I, don't, I don't know the way forward. If you will be humble enough to say, I do not have all the answers, Jesus will be your guide. For the people who are hell-bent on taking their own roadmaps, he'll, he's a gentleman, like he'll let us do our thing. But if we are wise enough to say, I don't have all the answers, he will be our wonderful counselor, our guide. The second thing we see here is that he wants to be our mighty God. This year in my journal, I began to, uh, um, when I was praying and, and writing out my prayers in my journal, I began to pray to the Lord on certain days, not every time, as the good Lord of the universe the good Lord of the universe. Uh, my grandmother used to call the Lord the good Lord, and I always thought it was like very southern and kind of like charming, but kind of beneath calling God the good Lord. Uh, and as I get older, I'm so thankful that A, he's the Lord, he's in control, that he is good, that this isn't just cosmic randomness, and that he is in control of the universe. He is the mighty God, the good Lord of the universe, stronger. He's stronger than all the other narrow ancient deities. We watched um, Thor. We watched, Owen and I watch all the Marvel movies, and we watched Thor this summer. And I, for, I can forget in the midst of those movies that Thor was, a, at once upon a time, was the actual deity of an actual people, the god of thunder of Norse mythology. And so we've laughed in our home that I remember having to write a paper in the fourth grade about Thor, the Norse god. And Owen's like, dang, you mean that's not just a comic book character? And I'm like, no, there was a time and place where people believed that this Thor was the god of thunder. And every nation had all their little collection of deities. And, all, and, and some nations would hijack other nations, and I remember having to memorize all of these little deities in school. And, and the good Lord of the universe, the mighty God, is stronger than all other localized, narrow deities. And also, he's stronger than my strength. He's stronger than my ignorance. He is stronger. And so we can lean into him. So again, let me read to you uh, this, where uh, J.D. Greer talks about... Um, the mighty God he says, undoubtedly, you have your own fears and struggles and failings and worries. Maybe you're trying to forget them over the Christmas season. Maybe there are things in your life no one else knows about, things so dark, so painful, you hardly dare even admit them to yourself. And you say, who on earth is able to help with this? Who could possibly get through that? Who could possibly sort that out? Who's able to find an answer to what I'm facing? I know I'm not. And Jesus says, I am. How am I supposed to know which way to go? He says, I am. I'm not really sure who's on my side. I am. Nobody's listening to me. I am. My marriage is crashing and I don't know where to turn. I am. 50, divorced. I feel like I'm starting all over. I am. 
Everybody thinks I can't do it. I am. What if I fail again? I am. I don't know if I can face the pain of my past. I am. I've made so many mistakes. I am. I'm given all I can give and it's not enough. I am. I just need a fix or a hit or a drink. I am. This Christmas season, I can't hold on. I am. I'm tired. I am. I quit. I am. I feel alone. I am. I need a fresh start. I am. I just need someone to hold me. I am. Here's what it means to know Jesus is the mighty God who has come to be with us and to prove he's there to show us he cares. It means that all you are not, for all that you need, for all that you fear, for all that you crave, he is the great and eternal I am. And so for the people who are strong enough to be weak, he will be the mighty God. We live in a culture that doesn't love weakness. And for the people who are strong enough to be weak, he will be the mighty God. Now here becomes the tough one. The third thing it says he'll be is the everlasting father. Now, I know this weekend's painful for a lot of people because it conjures up memories of imperfect dads. And when we hear something like this, I remember up until my late teenage years, I would hear people talk about God the Father, and I literally had no idea what they were talking about because my dad left when I was four. And the only memories I had before four were three bad ones with my dad. Disappointment, brokenness, and uh, sin. Um, And so Everlasting Father for me was not the best name because I didn't understand it, and it even created for me a lot of pain. And so maybe you're here today and you had an absent dad. Maybe you're here today and you had a never satisfied dad. Maybe you're here today and you had an unpredictable dad. Or maybe you're here today and you had a physically present but emotionally distant dad. Maybe that's your story. Like, can I just encourage you that this phrase took on a whole new meaning for me on May 29, 2009, when our first son was born. And uh, three of these I am a work in progress on. I refuse to ever be an absent dad. I will not leave. But the other three, (laughs) the unpredictable, poof, that can be me. Emotionally distant, I'll be honest, like I need God's help to be a present and good dad. I want to be a good dad. Um, Being a dad is hard. It's not hard for God, but it is hard for dads. If your dad wasn't the best, I get it. I get it. And if you had a great dad, and he has since stepped out of this life and into eternity, God gets it. Like, I get it. He will be our everlasting father. If you didn't have the best dad, don't let it victimize you. Even the best dads are a poor reflection of Father God. For the people longing to be done with disappointment, though, he will be the everlasting father. The eternal father, the father who never drops the ball. Hebrews 13, 5 says, God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Exodus 34, 6 says, God is slow to anger and he is abounding in covenant love. And then I want to read you this verse in Zephaniah, also written long, long before Jesus was born. Zephaniah says this, the Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save you. He will rejoice over you with gladness. And for those who had absent or overbearing dads, he will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. Man, I don't know, like, uh, I can remember my mom rocking chairing us in this big wicker rocking chair in my grandparents' bedroom. And the scripture says that God the Father will sing over us and celebrate us if we will long to be done with disappointment and turn to him. And then the fourth thing we see here is that he will be the prince of peace. That doesn't mean that there will be absence of uncertainty or hardship or disappointment or monumental tasks or answerless questions or even conflict. But Jesus will be the prince over it and in it and through it. It Makes me think about this song by uh, Rich Mullins. Let me read you this if I might. Uh, It's one of my favorite songs on my favorite Christian album of all time. It's a song called Hold Me Jesus and I won't sing it to you. I won't put you through that. You would never come back. But he says, sometimes my life just don't make sense at all when the mountains look so big and my faith just seems so small. So hold me, Jesus, because I'm shaking like a leaf. You have been king of my glory. Won't you be my prince of peace? And when he goes on and says this on the bridge of his song, it's one of the sweetest lines, the most honest lines I've ever heard in a Christian song. Surrender don't come natural to me. I'd rather fight you for something I don't really want than take what you give that I need. 
and I've beat my head against so many walls. Now I'm falling down. I'm falling on my knees. Man, we can be hard-headed. And in the midst of that, Jesus will hold us and hang on to us and never let us go. He is the Prince of Peace for people who feel this world is not enough. For people who feel this world and its troubles or it's this world and its victories still are not enough, Jesus will be our Prince of Peace. The vintage truths of Jesus 700 years before his birth were true of Jesus during his 30 plus years on earth. And they are still just as true of him today and trustworthy today. Still just as true and trustworthy of him today. He will be the everlasting father, the mighty God, the wonderful counselor, the prince of peace. But we have to believe him. And John 1.12, I'm going to throw this scripture up there. John 1.12 says this, But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. See, it's not enough that we just go, Oh, I believe there is a guy, and I believe he died on the cross, and We sing three songs on Sundays about, you know, he was born in a manger and there was all this stuff. And yeah, I believe that. I historically believe that stuff. No, we don't just believe it. Believing means we receive it. Receive it into our lives. Uh, If you'll go to that next slide, let me read you the last J.D. J.D. Greer. He's a much better J.D. preacher and writer. So he says, believing in his name does not just mean that you believe he existed or that he was special or that he can help you or even that he rose from the dead. Jesus is who he is. That's not up for a vote, but he won't be those things for you until you receive him, until you believe him. It's not up for a vote if he lived or not. He lived. It's not up for a vote if he died on a cross or not. Even the staunchest atheist would admit that a guy named Jesus of Nazareth lived 2,000 years ago and died on a cross. That's not even up for debate anymore with a serious, intellectually honest skeptic. We can talk about the resurrection, whether or not that actually happened. Look, we we can talk about that. That's the whole thing. That's why we're sitting here today as the resurrection. And in my deepest places of doubt, I don't believe that thousands of people had laid down their lives for a myth. Beginning in the generation that he was living and died and rose again. It's It's not up for a vote whether he lived and died. And I think even rose again. What's up for a vote is, will I receive him? Will I surrender my rights to myself and receive him? This Christmas season, the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace can be true in your life and present in your life. And and if you say, dude, I'm a Christian, I got it, locked down, this is set, I'm good. Like, let's move on, let's pray, let's do communion and get out of here. Listen, this can also be true in the lives of your friends and the lives of your family members and your coworkers and your neighbors. And even in the way that you give financially this year at Christmas, this can be true for somebody around the world who you may never meet. We literally get to participate in the destiny-shaping people as they meet the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace, as we believe it and live it and invite others into it and pray and serve and give. So let me pray for us. Lord, we love you. I, I think everyone in here, for the most part, would even say we, belie- we believe you. We believe Jesus. Maybe not with the certainty that Isaiah believed 700 years before you would come, so much that he spoke in present tense. But I think today we're here because on some level we believe or we're at least open to the idea that God put on skin and came and lived among humans sinlessly for 30 years. But God, the crux is, will we receive the gospel? Will we receive that good news? Will what is cognitively true in our brains become experientially true in our hearts and in our lives? and shape us. Lord, I pray for the one in here today who maybe is a skeptic. I pray for the one in here today who is wrestling with doubt. I pray for the one in here today who longs to believe, but believing seems like getting over Mount Everest. And they just think, I don't have the power to get there. And God, I thank you for the last phrase in verse 7 that says, the zeal of the Lord will do this. And so, God, right now, if someone in this 
room and the space would have the courage to say, God, I can't, but I am trusting that you can. I receive you. Will you come into my life? I'm surrendering my life to you today. God, I thank you for the gospel truth that in that confession of our sin and Jesus' uh, sinless sacrifice, his sinless su substitutionary death on the cross and victorious resurrection, that turning from sin and trusting in Christ is enough that we can be received as the children of God. So Lord, I, I pray that even today people are coming in here wanting to meet you and that they meet you and maybe today they would surrender themselves to you for the first time. Lord, I pray other, for others, I pray probably for the majority in this room who have given their lives to you. I pray that these bedrock truths would be true for us, that you are the everlasting Father, the wonderful Counselor, the mighty God, the Prince of Peace. I pray that when we feel untethered, unmoored, like our life is like drifting out, Maybe we're here today and we've had wandering hearts. This weekend has been hard, Lord. I pray that we would get anchored back into who you are. I thank you that the truth is not contingent on our belief of it. Our belief is contingent because it is true. Lord, remind us of that here in the next few moments. We love you. We bless you. We honor you, Jesus. As Nick shared earlier, we want to begin this Christmas season, this Advent season celebrating who you were, what you did, who you are, you're coming again. I want to believe these things differently and we want this to be the best Christmas ever for us as a bunch of households and individuals and for us as a church. In Jesus' name we pray.